Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, violence against Native American women, why it's disproportionately high, and why legal systems, both tribal and U.S., are failing to protect these women. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, across the table from me as usual, catching all your live feedback. So keep it coming. Tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. Malika, I've seen some tweets suggesting that this lack of justice stems from both a lack of resources and possibly even a culturally ingrained attitude that violence against Native American women is okay. I mean, it's something we're definitely going to have to get into on the show. You're right, Lisa. We're seeing that, and we're also seeing surprise and disgust among our community members that this is happening in what they say is basically the United States' backyard. Yeah. So for those of you at home, if you'd like to join the conversation, tweet us with the hashtag AJStream. Joining Malika and me in the studio is Rebecca St. George. She is a survivor of sexual assault and a women's advocate who is a board member of the Program for Aid to Victims of Sexual Assault, also known as POPSA. That group is based in the U.S. state of Minnesota. Rebecca, welcome to the stream. Thank you. This is your show, powered by your comments. And one way you can send them to us is by going to our website, stream.aljazeera.com. Then just click on this red button. And you can record a 30-second comment or even a story pitch for a future show. It's easy, and it's just another way that you can be in the stream. Hi, I'm Natasha, co-founder of the Dadaab Project, and I'm in the stream. In the United States, Native American women are facing an epidemic of sexual assault and violence. According to advocates for Native women, it's largely due to poor policing and a failed legal system that allows offenders who are non-Native Americans to get away with crimes committed on reservation land. Now, unfortunately, this has led to many unprosecuted cases and little justice. So, what is being done to improve the situation? In the U.S. Congress, there's an ongoing debate over whether Native American women should be protected under the Violence Against Women Act. Take a look at this video. It makes a case for that. Dear Senators and Representatives, I am a Native American woman. I live on Indian land in a Native community. I have a one in three chance of being raped in my lifetime. I am two and a half times more likely to be assaulted than other women in this country. My chances of being murdered is ten times the national average. Because of where I live, the law does not protect me. Because of who I am, the law does not protect me. This is not okay. I don't want to have to worry about this. Ever. I want the rights afforded other women. I want to be safe, and when my safety is violated, I want justice. You can do better than this. I deserve better than this. Pass a VAWA that protects me. My sister. My mom. My daughter. And generations to come. Pass a VAWA that keeps our Indian communities safe. Vote yes for me now. So that no means something tomorrow. Joining us to discuss these issues is Andrea Smith, a longtime anti-violence and Native American activist. She's the co-founder of Insight, Women of Color Against Violence. She also teaches at the University of California, Riverside, and she's joining us via Skype from California. And in St. Paul, Minnesota, we have Sarah Deer. She's an assistant professor of law at William Mitchell Law School. She specializes in tribal law, and her legal work focuses on violent crime on Indian reservations. Sarah and Andrea, welcome to you both. Thank you. Sarah, start us off by explaining this complex system of justice between tribal law, U.S. state and federal law, and then the accompanying jurisdictional issues. Sure. Well, it's difficult to, to describe in a short period of time, but I think the most important aspect of this jurisdictional question is that tribal governments, as of 1978, have no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So if you go onto a reservation and you're not part of a tribal community, uh, the tribe can't do anything to, um, they can't arrest you, they can't prosecute you, and I think that has a lot to do with the high rates of violence in tribal communities today. And explain to us a little more, if you would, the confusion, the complexity that goes along with um, you know, trying to arrest and or prosecute based on whether you're a resident of the reservation, whether you live off the reservation, and whose jurisdiction you might be in. Sure. Well, one, if you're on a reservation and a violent crime happens, there's potentially, in some cases, up to three different entities that could intervene. The state system, the federal system, and the tribal system. And sometimes when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, um, it becomes difficult to sort out exactly who does the investigation. Um, the federal government 
which is unusual for the federal government, has jurisdiction on a lot of tribal lands in the United States. Um, and they're not really in the business of prosecuting violent crime in the sense of interpersonal crime. Um, they generally will prosecute major drug trafficking cases or m white collar crime or white, you know, immigration concerns. And so when you, you end up having a federal prosecutor take jurisdiction over what may seem like a one time incident, there's not a priority there. Um, that would that you would see say in a state system with a state prosecutor so we've seen a lot of indifference from the federal government traditionally when it comes to these kinds of crimes so rebecca translate for us what that works out to then for real women experiencing real crimes on the ground on these reservations sure well one thing um when you introduce me as a survivor of sexual violence it occurs to me that um, most women who are native who i know are survivors of sexual violence Right, so we're talking about an epidemic where the numbers tell you one thing, the statistics tell you one thing, but real life is that most women that I know, most Native women that I know, have been raped. So even though the number is one in three, you're saying even that is underreported? I think so. I think it's absolutely underreported. Um, and while certainly an awful lot of women who get raped never tell anyone, or certainly never tell the system, an awful lot actually do and their cases fall through the cracks, either because, like Sarah was saying, there's just confusion, too many cooks in the kitchen, who's supposed to take it, that that happens all the time. There's also um, a piece of people just sort of almost deliberately letting it go. There's this issue of cooperation from victims of sexual assault. If they're not cooperating, we're not going to deal with it. And cooperation looks like a different thing to different people, and there's cultural barriers with how you communicate. And so not only are the, there are these crazy legal complications, but there are also sort of cultural barriers and historical trauma and what's normal. And so we have a mainstream justice system that says, oh, Indians are just violent and that's how they are, where you have a traditional um, community where, no, we're not. And that's not a traditional way of being, and that's not something that's happened to us traditionally. It was really introduced at a certain point in time. Well, Andrea, I'd, I'd like to uh, pose this video question to you. Uh, before I do, I'd like to read this tweet from Yasser Tina, who says, in his view, that could this be happening because predators view Native American women as an easier to target victim group? He says he's just theorizing. He, he doesn't know uh, as much about it as, he's, as he wants to know. But have a listen to this video comment, and I'd like your thoughts afterwards. It is more than statistics. It is an epidemic. Uh, what we're having right now in the United States is a humanitarian crisis. Uh, we as Native American women are walking targets. We label it as historical trauma because we keep passing down this pain generationally um, because there has never been an interruption to colonization and there has never been an intervention to interpersonal violence. Andrea, your thoughts? Yes, the reason why there's uh, epidemic rates of sexual violence in Native communities is because it is the result of U.S. policies. As Rebecca noted, it's not the case that Native peoples were culturally more violent. This was actually introduced to Native communities through U.S. policies. Uh, the biggest one was the boarding school policy, where Native children were forcibly abducted from their homes, uh, subjected to physical, routine, uh, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and not return until they're 18. And this is where dysfunctionality starts to become introduced into Native communities. And as of yet, U.S. has not made any redress or even acknowledgement of the damage it has done to Native communities. So, you know, kind of these solutions that are being posited are important, but the larger context by which sexual violence came to Native communities in the first place has not been addressed, and that's why there are many groups like the Boarding School Healing Project that are calling for the U.S. to be accountable for the policies that have created such damage. Rebecca, what about this idea of social conditioning? You know, these women on reservations in particular, they live in very small, tightly knit communities. Everybody knows everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if you've been conditioned to know that this crime is not going to be addressed, the perpetrator is not going to be punished, it's not going to be prosecuted, that's, that's got to influence how you respond to a crime as a woman. Yes, although I think how women respond to it has very little to do with what's happening. I think um, 
if women could stop rape by responding somehow, it would have been gone generations ago, right? So it's not about how the women are responding, it's about how the system is responding, and it's about how we're responding to the perpetrators, and about how we hold women who are being assaulted and violated, how we're holding them responsible to do something about it. How do we account for the under-reporting then, if women aren't reporting these crimes? Well, I don't know that reporting is going to fix it. I mean, I think that that's sort of where the fallacy is. You know, we tell women, as advocates even sometimes, well, you just need to go to the police. The police will do something. Well, they're conditioned to believe the police won't do anything because in a lot of communities and in a lot of places, they won't. And in fact, the women will be hurt worse. And so institutionally, saying that women need to report, that's not helping. If we can respond better to the women who do report, because an awful lot of them do, that might start to change the paradigm a little bit. So, Sarah, in the U.S., the Violence Against Women Act has helped decrease uh, sexual violence about 60 percent in the last 18 years. And now it's being debated, the reauthorization of that is being debated, and there's argument over a, provis over a provision uh, over whether Native American women should be included. Uh, if they are included, do you see that as, as helping significantly? I think it's a start. Um, I think that the the Senate version of the Violence Against Women Act, which I think is the real VAWA, um, is um, doing some kind of piecemeal fixes that will eventually, if, if things continue, will put tribal governments in a position where they can take action when women in their community are, are attacked. Um, and one of the provisions is actually to address the, the concern I raised earlier, which is that tribal governments do not have criminal authority over non-Indians. The Violence Against Women Act, as it's written in the Senate version, um, would allow tribal governments to take action in cases where a non-Indian uh, violates, um, is violent against. So, so Sarah, I, I just I just want to be very clear here so people understand. What you're saying is that someone who is a non-Native American goes onto a reservation, commits a crime, and then they cannot be prosecuted by the tribal government? Correct. They cannot be prosecuted by the tribal government. They can be prosecuted by, the, in some cases, the federal government and in other cases, the state government. The problem is that those foreign governments um, don't often react or respond. So Rebecca, it looks like we're kind of seeing uh, this is a double-edged sword here. There's a tweet here from Direction. She says, we know that sex offenders are particularly targeting women on tribal jurisdictions because, just as was mentioned, tribal police can't arrest them. On the other hand, there's also a tweet from Sarah who says, in such cultures, talking about sexual violence is taboo and reporting such crimes is seen as bringing shame to the family. Is that true in Native American societies? But, and also, what really is the incentive uh, if you know at the end of the day there might not be prosecution? Is that true? I, you know, I don't know that I can speak to whether that's absolutely true. Certainly, um, in, in a lot of communities, women are talking about it. This is why we're here right now. This is why, you know, the work that Sarah and Andy have done has made such an international splash is because we are talking about it and we are doing something about it. Now, there's certainly a lot of grooming that goes along with sexual violence, and the grooming doesn't just happen by the individual perpetrators, it happens by the community, right? And so there is that don't talk about it, don't let anything happen, but I don't think that's unique to Indian cultures. I don't think it's unique to reservation communities. I think that's very common wherever you find that kind of sexual violence. So, again, when the question remains what are victims doing about it, what are we doing to change how they respond, it's never going to change because victims of these crimes have done everything under the sun. They've screamed from the rooftops and they've kept it quiet and they've done everything in between. And that doesn't change it because we're looking to the wrong people to change it. We have to change how we respond to perpetrators. We have to res change how we raise young men and boys who some of them end up committing these crimes, certainly not most of them, but enough of them that what are, what are we doing where we're telling some people in our community that it's okay to do this to someone else. And after you do it, we're just gonna blow it aside. And we're gonna say that maybe that victim of that crime did something wrong. And that's why the, it just keeps getting worse is because they're not reporting it. They're not saying it right. They're not talking to the police. They're not doing a good interview. They're drunk they're homeless, they're, f you know, fill in the blank. As long as we continue with that attitude, nothing's going to change. 
Andrea, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we're talking about not blaming the victims here and really addressing the people that need to be addressed to get these things to change. And as much as we're talking about uh, Native American women maybe being included in VAWA and getting the right resources to the right people, more than resources, this almost sounds like an issue of resolve. There has to be resolve on the part of police, uh, the tribal communities, and on the part of the U.S. government in terms of state and federal authorities to, one, work together, yes, mm -hmm. and then, two, figure out a plan forward to, to stop this from happening. Yeah, I really want to affirm what Rebecca has said. I think when we look at this issue, there's a tendency to say, oh, the problem is Native communities are so dysfunctional, what can be done? And we don't look at all the political acts, all the policies that made this a problem in the first place. And Native communities had accountability structures that stopped this from happening, and it's the U.S. government's policies that destroyed them. So it doesn't make sense to say we don't support tribal governments uh, strengthening their abilities to address these problems because that's the best way to end violence. And that's not just true for Native communities, it's true for all communities. Uh, we don't have a problem where there's just a few wacko guys we need to lock up. We have surveys in which half of men of all races say they would rape somebody if they thought they could get away with it. Right? So when we have large-scale acceptance of gender violence, we need community-based responses that say we no longer tolerate this kind of violence. So any kind of support that's not just about get a few more police here or there, but it's actually about developing community infrastructure to hold people accountable is the way we need to go if we really do want to end violence. Okay, so what about, you know, in 2010, in 2010, Obama signed the Tribal Law and Order Act, and that was supposed to do a lot of things. It was supposed to decrease violence against Native women, strengthen, strengthen tribal law enforcement. In the last almost two years now, what, what's happened? Has it made any significant dent? I think the act was one small step towards the larger movement that we are building for communities saying we will no longer tolerate violence and we will build the structures ourselves to stop violence from happening in our communities. So it's unrealistic to expect one simple act is going to solve all our problems, but these things make a difference in developing uh, the capabilities for uh, tribal governments to develop the infrastructures to hold people accountable. I think that's an interesting point, and I'd like to raise one made here on Twitter from our community member, Peter, who says, 20 years ago, I did some consulting work with Native American tribes. U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs acted like a colonial office, he says. In my view, <laughs> legislation and laws are a waste, like the ancient treaties. They don't matter when there's a powerful oppressor. Um, uh, from that, I'd like to turn to a video comment, and Sarah, have a listen to this. Uh, my name is Direction, and just one more point. We also know that on tribal jurisdictions, there are rarely any sex offender registries. And so we're hearing sometimes from uh, more law enforcement agencies that sex offenders are actually targeting women, particularly on tribal jurisdictions, because the tribal PD, do, they do not have the jurisdiction to arrest them. And actually, not just um, sex offenders, but we're also beginning to hear that traffickers are also targeting women on tribal jurisdictions. So what are your recommendations of improving that? Are we seeing those issues? Sex offender registry, I think, is a little bit of a red herring in this work. Um, the problem with sex offender registries, regardless of where you are, is that they're only going to capture convicted uh, people who've been convicted of sex crimes. And given what we know about the system, most men who rape are not going to appear on those sex offender registries. So it's one of the efforts that's kind of a mainstream American approach. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to resolve the problem um, event, you know, completely. In terms of traffickers, I would say we're starting to know more about sex trafficking on Indian reservations, but I would I would suggest that that is also not a new phenomenon. And in fact, um, colonizers have used sex trafficking as a, a tool of war for centuries. And so we may be hearing about it for the first time now, but I think it's been going on for a long time. Uh, Rebecca, talk a little bit about the effect that sexual violence has on the Native American community? Um, well, so there's this piece of isolation that happens to somebody when they've been raped. A very, very integral part of any Native community that I'm familiar with is the interrelationship of everyone, the importance of everyone, right? We don't, we don't downplay the importance of children, elders, our parents, that's all very important. And so it tears at that exact fabric. It's one of the reasons that sexual violence is such an effective 
weapon of war that it's been so effective historically and continues to be because it puts people it, it makes them alone it does something just very spiritually deeply spiritual to anyone who's been raped that tears them apart from their community in a way that um, it's just it's very effective I don't know I'm losing losing my language here but it's it's a terrible terrible travesty and it's happening you know to our children it's happening to our boys and girls it's happening to our women our young women you know and when we address it a lot of the times it's really easy institutionally to say okay we're against sexual assault of children so we're gonna do something about that um, but once somebody's 18 you know you look at trafficking you look at how sex gets used well they're making choices we, we're all about how victims make choices about it and that, that therefore that's what keeps it going and that hurts our whole community and it makes people less valuable or makes them feel less valuable and treats them as though they're less valuable. Sarah and Andrea, you've both looked at this issue with indigenous women in other countries. Sarah, I'll, I'll go to you first. Have you seen a commonality between what's going on with native communities in the U.S. and in other countries around the globe? Yes. In fact, I think um, you see four countries in particular where the indigenous population uh, of women in particular um, is, re is experiencing an extremely high rate of violence. Those four countries are the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Very similar statistics, very similar histories. And Andrea? for everybody to the United Nations report on boarding schools in indigenous communities around the world where we see this routine practice of indigenous children being taken away from their homes where they did have community accountability structures, have those structures destroyed and be put in situations where they're routinely sexually abused and this is where sexual violence begins and in all contexts we see a reluctance from the federal governments to be accountable for these practices to blame native communities for the violence that they've in fact introduced into native communities and shows the need for developing a comprehensive approach for violence that looks at all of the, uh, all of the things that give rise to this problem in the first place. Okay, and that is something, we're gonna pause our discussion there uh, and we will continue it in the online post show and that is the first thing we wanna talk about is what is the comprehensive approach? What is a logical solution to this issue? But before we do that, we wanna to get to Malika who's got a few other stories that we're following. As tensions rise between China and Japan over disputed islands, the battle online is also shifting. Chinese search engine Baidu made its position clear on the anniversary of Japan's 1931 invasion of Manchuria, showing an image of China's flag on the islands. A Baidu official told the blog The Next Web that it was encouraging citizens to be rational. Planting a digital flag is a much better alternative to throwing rocks or smashing cars, he said, referencing violent protests like this one. Baidu has also created a site where more than one million have planted their own digital flag. Our next leads from the Chinese city of Wuhan, where one man is protesting sanitation at a local KFC. To bring visibility to the issue, the man tried to buy 2,000 buckets of chicken. He only received 22 and then used the food to block the entrance. These pictures here are from Chinasmack.com. He was reportedly angry that restaurant employees didn't wear gloves, hair nets, or face masks while handling food. The company responded, saying it's established stricter rules regarding food safety. And in the UK, a fantasy writer is letting readers watch the creation of her latest novel online. Sylvia Hartman's use of a public Google Doc means anyone can see her work as she types. Readers can't edit, but they can leave suggestions on Twitter and Facebook, which she responds to. Just did a first edit over the document. For those anticipating grand changes, I have the feeling there will be disappointment in store. We'll share your thoughts on those stories. Tweet us with the hashtag AJStream. Lisa? Stay with us. The post show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. Now, on Wednesday, we talked to Israelis about growing concerns over Iran's nuclear program and the possibility of a unilateral Israeli military strike. So tweet us your thoughts on that or send us a video comment. And until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back to the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about violence against Native American women and the ways justice can be achieved in their cases. I want to pick up our conversation where we left off. Sarah Deer, Assistant Professor of Law at William Mitchell Law School, uh, you ended the show by saying we need to have a comprehensive solution that gets all of the involved parties together uh, to figure out how to solve this thing. What are your thoughts on that? What are your ideas for a comprehensive solution? Well, I think the key is to ensure that uh, Native women have access to comprehensive advocacy services. Um, so we start at the ground level with grassroots work, um, shelter programs, crisis lines, um, culturally specific programming where Native women will feel supported. Um, the, the next piece is to ensure that tribal governments have full authority to respond to these kinds of crimes um, in their own way and on their own terms. So there's, there's the two pieces. There's the advocacy piece and there's the legal reform piece. Andrea, why won't the U.S. Congress give tribal governments the authority to deal with these issues properly? Well, this has been a continuing historical problem where um, U.S. government officials always deem Native communities to be lawless, even though they were not, and then essentially disrupt uh, their legal regimes and replace them with things that don't work. So. The U.S. does not seem to want to be in a position to admit that they made a mistake and then let tribal governments reconstitute the um, structures that had worked previously, even though they may not be what they were before, at least to start beginning uh, responses that will make sense for where we are now. So again, I think the problem is not looking at the historical roots of how violence came topic of those historical roots, Rebecca, there's a comment here from Elizabeth on Facebook and she says, Native American women often leave tribal lands because the tribal laws are so lax about this type of violence. Lack of education and jobs contributes to this. She also mentions things like men, years of men feeling oppressed, that's contributed to alcohol, alcoholism and domestic violence. How much does those two things, domestic violence, alcoholism, how does that you know, play into this? Huge. They're huge. They're not things that necessarily... Um, cause the violence, um, there is a lot of alcoholism. Um, there is an awful lot of domestic violence. But to say that um, tribal governments are necessarily lackadaisical, I think, is a little bit of a twist from my understanding, which is not that they're lackadaisical, but, but, but that they have had, you know, what Andy was just talking about, they've taken away their power. We've, we've had this very, very overt historical timeline that shows how it's been taken away so that tribal governments haven't been allowed to take the steps that they need to. The power has been you know, largely given to state and federal authorities who sometimes will and sometimes won't. And so it's really easy, like with domestic violence, you know, an awful lot of children who live in homes where there's domestic violence blame their mother who's getting battered mm -hmm. for what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Like this is a really common mm -hmm. thing to happen. Well, so an awful lot of people in tribal communities will often blame the tribe that's also being battered by the federal government. And so it's sort of, um, it's who's there and you can grab onto, which isn't to say that all tribal governments are doing a great job. They're not. There are problems, but they need to be empowered to be able to do something about it. Andrea, I know you want to jump in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I was just going to affirm that we can't, we can't look at violence separated from the larger things that are going on in Native communities with the lack of economic opportunity uh, as a result of relocation, et cetera, the massive amount of resources taken from Native lands, all these things are examples of where Native communities as a whole are violated, yeah. right? When we look at the issues of sterilization abuse, when we look at the issues mm. of environmental racism, it's a constant policy to not respect the integrity of Native bodies or the integrity of Native land. So we're not going to be able to solve this problem without looking at it as it relates to all the other problems that Native communities are facing. Hey, Sarah, there are a lot of different numbers out there in terms of who the perpetrators are of these crimes against women, where they come from, whether they're on the reservation, off the reservation. What, what's your sense of, of what the, the most accurate numbers are? Well, we, if we go with the federal government statistics, it's, um, it's the Department of Justice that has issued the reports indicating that the majority of perpetrators are non-native. Um, that's really unusual in American criminal um, statistics. Usually crime is intra-racial. Um, so it's the only exception to that. There's some skepticism about those numbers, and I'm not sure that we know enough to be able to tell 
folks exactly what the breakdown is. But I've never seen a study that has suggested that Native women aren't the most victimized population in the United States. The issue of race of the perpetrator is important for tribal jurisdictional issues, but from a survivor's perspective, it doesn't matter what race your perpetrator is, you still want justice. And talk about the the punishment. It's, it's quite limited, isn't it? Tribal governments have been um, limited as of 1968 to the kind of uh, prison sentence they can impose, and that's uh, one year for each crime. And so when you look at a state or federal government that might be able to put someone away for 10 to 12 years or more for sexual assault, the tribal limitation seems to be an impediment. But that being said, tribal governments really didn't use incarceration traditionally. So when we focus on the Anglo-American model of criminal justice, it may be that tribal governments have other options like banishment or um, other kinds of ceremonial um, sanctions that could be imposed. Um, that wouldn't rely totally on incarceration. Is it your sense that there's a violation of international human rights laws going on here? Yes, in fact Amnesty International came to that conclusion in 2007. Rebecca, I hear you and see you shaking your head on that one. Yes. I, yeah, I don't know that I can say much more. The Amnesty report that Sarah actually worked a lot on um, is pretty damning. I Saying think. that there is a responsibility on the part of the U.S. government to yes. make sure that this is not yeah. occurring. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're quick to be all up at arms about other violations against women in other parts of the world when the things that are happening right here against Native women are pretty horrific, and other women, but particularly against Native women. So Andrea, talk a little bit about the coordination between the Department of Justice and tribal justice and tribal police and U.S. state and federal authorities. Is there anything promising happening in terms of dialogue between them? Well, I just w did want to mention one thing about the human rights standards. I think it's important to note that uh, states are responsible not just for um, human rights violations, but for the continuing effects of these human rights violations. So insofar as we can see, sexual violence is the result of the human rights violations um, that happen to the boarding school policy. The U.S. is absolutely responsible for redressing these violations contradiction to international legal standards when it does not provide appropriate means to uh, Okay, and because we're sort of losing your audio at the moment, I'm going to bounce over to Sarah with that same question. Do you see any positive coordination uh, occurring? I do. Um, actually, it's, it's, its onset was with this new administration. Um, the Obama administration has sent directives to the federal prosecutors that they will work in partnership with tribal communities. Um, it's hard to solve overnight, but we are seeing some progress. One of the things that's happened is that tribal prosecutors in certain circumstances can be um, assigned a, a role as a federal prosecutor for the purposes of these kinds of crimes. And that's already happening. So the transition that I would like to see ultimately is to have tribal jurisdiction restored. In the meantime, I'm intrigued by the kinds of solutions that this administration has been proposing. All right, Rebecca St. George, going to give you the last word. Why don't you wrap this up for us? Well, I'm really grateful that you're doing the show, honestly. I think it's one of these things that isn't recognized enough here. Um, much less internationally, and I'm very grateful to you for looking at this issue and taking it on. So thank you, and I'm honored that you invited me to be out well, here. Thank you for being on the show, and our thanks to Andrea Smith and Sarah Deer, and of course all of our online community. Now tomorrow we're going to be talking to Israelis about growing concerns over Iran's nuclear program and the possibility of a unilateral Israeli military strike. So tweet us your thoughts on that, and until then, we'll see you online.